This week's program is dedicated to the memory of Richard Benal, my father, who passed away on May 19, 2007. He is missed tremendously, but we take solace in knowing that he's in a better place now. Benal of America. 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 Audio. This is Tim Benall of BenallofAmerica.com with another edition of Ben All of America Audio Season 2. It is June 2nd, 2007, and this week we kick off the final five episodes of Ben All of America Audio Season 2. And I'll warn you ahead of time right now, I am sick as a dog. I don't know what it is, pollen allergies or something, I'm not sure, but I'm just run down, exhausted. That's why this episode is coming at you so late. And that's on top of all this drama that went on here at Benal of America over the past month. I will uh, talk about that in a little bit, but we don't want to take away from the guests, so we'll handle all that business at the end of the program, because we have a spectacular guest for you this week, and we want to just dive right into the interview. Our guest this week is Gary A. David, author of The Orion Zone, which investigates the strange correlation between monuments and settlements of the Native American Hopi tribe and the stars of the constellation Orion. We're going to talk about the logistics of that connection, how and why the Hobie settled the way they did, their god, Masao, who just may have been a gray alien, the strange race of ant people who helped the Hobie throughout their history, the lost city inside the Grand Canyon, the global Orion connection, Hopi prophecy for the future, and much, much more. It is an astro-archaeology-themed in all of America audio, taking you to a whole new realm of esoterica that we've yet to discuss here on the program. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Gary A. David, let me give you a little bit of background on him. Gary A. David has been intrigued by the Four Corners region of the United States since his initial trip there in 1987. The following year, he sojourned to northern New Mexico, where he studied rock art and indigenous ruins. In late 1994, he moved to Arizona and began an intensive research of the ancestral Puebloans and their descendants, the Hopi. This resulted in his book, The Orion Zone, Ancient Star Cities of the American Southwest, published in late 2005. His articles have appeared in Ancient American and Atlantis Rising magazines, and are forthcoming in Fate and World Explorer magazines. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Kent State University, and a Master of Arts in the Literature of the American West from the University of Colorado. He is the author of a number of books, including A Log of Deadwood, a postmodern epic of the South Dakota Gold Rush, and Tierra Zia, Poems and Petroglyphs from New Mexico, both available from Amazon.com. He is also editor and webmaster of Island Hills Books, an online publishing house, distribution center, and showcase for literature that focuses on the spirit of place. David has worked as a college instructor of English and creative writing, a traveling ambassador for the South Dakota Arts Council, and a professional lead guitarist and vocalist. He currently lives in rural northern Arizona, where, thankfully, the skies are still relatively pristine. His website is www.theorionzone.com, T-H-E-O-R-I-O-N-Z-O-N-E.com. Without any further ado, let's rock and roll. This interview was recorded on April 27, 2007, Gary A. David, talking about the Orion Zone on Banal of America Audio, Season 2. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Been All of America Audio. Our guest this week is Gary A. David, the author of The Orion Zone, Ancient Star Cities of the American Southwest, a very thorough and interesting book from Adventures Unlimited Press. He's here to talk to us this week about The Orion Zone and and, uh, delve all into that stuff. So welcome to the show, Gary David. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. 
And, of course, you can pick up the book at adventuresunlimitedpress.com and find out more information on Gary and the book at theorionzone.com. Those are the websites. Check them out. Uh, let's start out first, Gary, with your bio, your background. Okay. Um, I have got interested in uh, Native Americans um, uh, quite a while ago. Um, I lived for about 15 years in South Dakota and uh, taught on Pine Ridge Reservation, taught English there and uh, got involved with uh, the Native American community and um, attended some of the ceremonies, uh, witnessed a sun dance on uh, Pine Ridge, and uh, also did some uh, sweat lodges and so forth. And uh, just got fascinated in, in the Native American culture. I grew up uh, in Ohio, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, really the only Indians I knew about were the Cleveland Indians, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> um, you went, when I came out west here, it was a totally different uh, mindset. And, uh, and uh, I lived, like I say, in the South Dakota for 15 years. And then um, I moved down to Arizona, and um, I, I've lived here now for about 12 years. Uh, so um, and I started um, going to the Hopi Reservation and seeing uh, some of the uh, the ceremonies there, the, specifically the Kachina dances on the Hopi Reservation, and uh, started going there and um, went to a lot of the ruin sites uh, in the region, um, the Anasazi uh, ruin sites in the area, and just uh, got fascinated with the culture. You say you're, you're fascinated with the culture. What drew you to uh, this this uh, this interesting line of research? I guess tying the the, the stars to to the uh, to the elements on Earth. Okay, what what um, sort of opened was, your mind to that idea? I was I was driving up to one of these Kachina dances um, in northern Arizona, um, uh, east of Flagstaff, and the Hopi have settled on three primary mesas. Um, the first, second, and third mesa is, is how they designate them. Um, and um, I was looking off in the distance and uh, looking at these three uh, three large mesas that uh, they built villages on top of and at the base of. Um, and I had just uh, read Robert Bouval's book, The Orion Mystery. This is, I read this back in 1997. Um, and um, I, I started thinking about well, you know, uh, there you know there was an Orion correlation on the Giza plateau. The three major pyramids uh, at Giza were uh, corresponded to the belt stars of Orion. And um, I, I noticed that uh, these three mesas up there they were equally spaced. Um, they're about seven miles apart, and they run from east to west. I thought, well, well, perhaps the, uh, there's an Orion correlation right here in Arizona. And um, I kind of put that in the back of my mind. And uh, when I got home, I got out um, got out my maps and got out the uh, sky charts. And, you know, what I found just, uh, just astounded me. It's just amazing the uh, correlation between the villages, the ancient villages of the Hopi, and the stars uh, of Orion. They're, they're basically, there's a... An ancient village or a ruined site corresponding to every major star in, in the constellation Orion. So uh, it's even more of an exact uh, uh, copy than uh, the one at, at Giza. So it just, and then I start. I started in from there to uh, to research um, the sky ground correlation. And and as you note in the in the beginning of the book, the primary I guess uh, genre of research. That the book is is astroarchaeology, which is a, a, a burgeoning new field. Uh, talk a little bit about astroarchaeology, what it is, and, and how you go about uh, using different elements in, in, in studying that sort of thing. Well, um, the, the Hopi were very tuned in, and still are very tuned in to um, to watching the sun in particular, and the, the way the sun rises on the horizon, and it's kind of their their uh, agricultural calendar. They uh, they see where the sun rises. Um, on the horizon, for instance, uh, uh, on the vernal equinox and autumnal equinox, the sun rises due east and west on the horizon. Um, as you, you get uh, closer to uh, to summer, the first day of summer, the summer solstice, the sun rises a little bit um, more north on the horizon each day. So, and then there's a final northern position on the horizon. Um, and uh, it happens to be uh, 60, 60 degrees azimuth um, at this latitude, but um, uh, 
the Hopi were very concerned with, uh, you know, where where on the horizon the sun was at a given time of year because it gave them a sense of um, where to plant and um, um, when to plant. Um, and uh, a lot of their buildings are aligned to these uh, these um, summer solstice, especially the summer and winter solstice sunrise. They're very important uh, points of the year, and a lot of their buildings. Ruins are are aligned to uh, to these uh, points on the horizon. Um, the uh, the major ruin of uh, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico has uh, a lot of these uh, alignments. The buildings are aligned to uh, uh, various points on the horizon that line up with the sun at a given time of year. So it, it's it's a it's kind of a very important uh, part of their cosmology. Talk a little bit about the Hopi people for the listeners who really aren't aren't up on on the various Native American cultures and what have you. Uh, talk a little bit, uh, you know, like about the Hopi people and what made them different from the other Native American tribes. Because it did sound like from reading the book that they were dramatically different in a lot of ways from other Native Americans. Uh, yeah, the Hopi uh, are an agrarian sort of people. That that is, they uh, they're they're basically farmers. Um, they're sedentary. They built uh, large villages. Uh, the, uh, for instance, the uh, the Lakota, which I talked about before in the South Dakota, they're a uh, more nomadic uh, nomadic tribe. And uh, but the Hopi uh, had villages, and uh, they established these villages uh, very early. Um, this, uh, for instance, this template uh, of of Orion uh, began about 1050 A.D. Um, and um, it took a couple centuries for this template to be developed in um, in Arizona, but the Hopi were here um, a long time before that in uh, in more isolated what what is called pit houses, which is are isolated um, structures, not villages per se, pueblo villages per se, but the more isolated structures. Um, and and the Hopi, um, their uh, uh, their ceremonial life is very rich. It still is. Um, um, they have um, it's a constant uh, cyclic uh, a ceremonial life that they carry on uh, to even today. Um, for instance, uh, the Kachina dances, which I mentioned before, they they start about this time of year in April, and uh, they run through um, just after the summer solstice um, in in July. They they conclude uh, the Kachina dances. Um, and this, that's when the monsoons come, and, and the, the the major portion of the rains come in in July, and that concludes the Kachina season. So uh, there's a, a very rich cultural life uh, on the Hopi reservation that um, that you can still experience today, and uh, if you go up there. And um, this sort of uh, this sort of touches on something that we had uh, in a conversation with a previous guest who studied uh, in Australia and studied the Aborigines. Who are obviously somewhat along the same lines as the American Native Americans, mm-hmm. and we talked about sort of overcoming that cultural difference when you're trying to study something in this esoteric realm, because you know they a lot of their stuff is 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 hidden within myths and legends and stuff stuff they don't want to share with with outsiders. How did you overcome that that sort of cultural difference to to study the Hopis and and, and find out more about their mythology that sort of laid the groundwork a lot for the Orion zone? Well, the the Hopi are, are uh, very um, they're not very forthcoming with uh, what they want to share. They're very guarded in uh, in their uh, sacred lore and uh, and their myths. Um, uh, fortunately, there's been a lot of ethnological uh, research done um, in the late 19th century and early 20th century that uh, you can you can have access to. As well as you know, on-site uh, field work that you can do at the at the Hopi reservation. But it's it's always it's always rather dicey to to, uh, to go up there and and try to uh, get information because you don't want to be uh, too pushy or too uh, you know you, you just kind of want to feel out the situation and make sure that you're not stepping on any toes or, or trying to uh, to uh, get information that you shouldn't really know about. There there's a classified information that. Uh, the Hopi will not discuss at all. So um, it's 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 very hard to go, to go up there and uh, and make your way there because it, it, just uh, simple things like uh, the schedule for Kajina dances. You'll go up there and you, not really knowing where uh, what village has a Kajina dance on a given day, and you have to just kind of ask around and just feel your way along. And um, 
Um, I've uh, come across uh, w one uh, man, a Hopi man in particular, who is is kind of uh, acting as a go-between between, between uh, uh, me and uh, the Hopi elders, and uh, he's discussing this material with with the elders, and uh, they're they're. Um, you know the Orion correlation is is being looked at pretty favorably up there, uh, but though they don't really want to come out and say, well, yeah, that's it. You know, so yeah. I'm just what I'm doing is just putting the information out there that makes sense to me. This this pattern, uh, this uh, sky ground pattern, and if you look uh, the, at the maps on my website, you get the idea that uh, there's something going on here because. There's a village located exactly where it's supposed to be in, in relation to the to the constellation. It's just it's an uncanny um, correlation between uh, celestial and terrestrial. Just amazing. And to sort of delve into that now, I guess the first question, I guess it's in, in a way sort of a devil's advocate, sort of a skeptical question in a way, I guess, but, but it's more of a I'm intrigued by this idea. Uh, do they give a reason for how this pattern came about? Well, the the constellation Orion is the most important constellation ceremonially for the Hopi. Um, for instance, during the winter solstice ceremony, um, it's it's held at night, and um, they perform it in what is called a kiva, which is a, a subterranean prayer chamber. And you get uh, you get down into this kiva by going down through a ladder in the roof of the structure, and uh, there's a uh, there's a hatchway that um, that is open during the ceremony, and um, when the constellation Orion appears in this hatchway, that means that the ceremony should start. So they more or less synchronize uh, this particular ceremony and and to an extent others. Uh, uh, by the appearance of Orion in when Orion appears in the hatchway of the the overhead hatchway of the kiva, so um, ceremony is very important. Um, there's a, a major figure in the, in the Hopi mythology, um, and it, uh, this figure is, is named Masau. Mm -hmm. Masau is is the god of uh, the earth, um, the underworld, um, and um, it's the god, also the god of death. So it's kind of a, a spooky god. It's a, it's a nocturnal god, one of the few nocturnal gods that, that the Hopi have. And um, Masao is uh, really the um, the terrestrial equivalent of the constellation Orion. Uh, Masao is said to um, travel across the entire Earth uh, in one night before morning comes. So. Uh, you know, Masao is um, a pretty. Uh, there's a picture of Masao in my book, and it's it's. Um, uh, well, I'll I'll just describe it and um, uh, this god and see what you think. Uh, this god has a very large round eyes and a, a large round mouth, and it, it's a bald. It has a bald head, um, and it kind of resembles a summer squash in the texture. And, and the forehead bulges out, and the, the feet are very long, and the arms are very long. And the god, uh, the, the root word M-A-S, Mas, means gray. So uh, the root word of Masao means gray. So, you know, Masao uh, seems to me to look like very, very much like a, an extraterrestrial gray. Now, what about the logistics of this? Is where I'm going, sort of, with the with the devil's advocate form of question, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, what about the logistics of actually, you know, designing a whole society uh, around the Orion constellation? Is that something that could have been done from Earth, uh, from you know, from people who lived on Earth, and, and and just based on what they could see in the sky, that they could logistically design something on Earth? that mirrored what was in the sky? Like, is that even possible, or would it require uh, some sort of help from outside? Well, um, I use the term loosely. The, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, way, the way I think it happened, uh, I think Masao, this god, directed where to build the villages. Masao was there at the beginning of uh, the Hopi migrations. The Hopi made many migrations for centuries around the American Southwest, and they would go to a, a place and build a village, and then suddenly, uh, for, for, for no apparent reason, would would um, 
would leave the village and abandon this village and go on and, and build a village in another spot. And I think the god Masao was, was um, directing uh, this template, uh, the construction of this template, which, as I said, began in about 1050 A.D. and co concluded a little bit after 1300 A.D. Um, you know, the, the god Masao was there at the beginning of the migrations. And then when the Hopi, uh, you know, finally um, settled on the, the three major mesas, he was there to assist them and uh, taught them uh, farming techniques and so forth. So, th I, you know, this god um, may, I think, probably directed uh, the building of this. Now, how logistically they did it, um, you know, if if they were on their own without this god, I, I really can't say because these uh, this pattern is so so exact. Um, I really don't know how they would do it. Um, a, a, a colleague of mine, Crichton Miller, uh, he's, you might have uh, read his book about the Celtic cross. He believes that the Maya had a version of the, of the Celtic cross and the Hopi had a version of the Celtic cross. And they used these uh, to, uh, to uh, so position the villages uh, in, in an exact way. And, and uh, in fact, he, he thinks that the, uh, the pyramids were also um, um, positioned um, with, this, with this Celtic uh, cross. And in fact, uh, the Hopi do have a uh, an artifact that resembles uh, a Celtic cross. It's uh, called a, a manco. Um, it's a ritual artifact that is, it looks very much like uh, like a cross and uh, like a Celtic cross. So um, they they might have had uh, help this way. It's it's hard to say. But, yeah. Um, um, but you know, I, I I do think Masao, the god Masao, had a had a great deal to do with uh, the way this this um, pattern is laid out on the Arizona desert. And he's a, he's a key figure in the book, and, and uh, the, the illustration that you mentioned is definitely one of the most powerful images in the book. A uh, very frightening, creepy picture of a uh, of, of, uh, representation of what he would look like, and, and uh, one of the things that stands out in the book, <laughs> definitely one of the things that stands out in the book after you read it. Yeah, uh, uh, well, you image. know, the Hopi don't like to talk about Masao very much. Um, I, I took a class with a Hopi woman at the Yavapai College, which is in Prescott, Arizona, and um, she wouldn't even discuss Masao at all. Uh, you know, I, I asked about this particular god, and she, you know, I mean, it's it's almost like taboo to talk about this god because he is a god of death and and the underworld. So there's a lot of uh, it's kind of there, it's it's kind of a a, a spooky uh, a negative force going on here. Uh, What's the religious aspect like with the Hobi culture? He, is he just one of many gods, and, and where I guess would he rank in the hierarchy of the Hobi gods? Well. Um, this god is, is a major deity. There's also the sun god, Tawa, and there's a uh, spider woman, which is a, a female figure that uh, plays into my, to the mythology. And um, there, are, there are a number of Hopi gods. There's a Hopi sky god uh, as well that uh, is kind of related to Masao. But um, um, Masao is one of, the, one of the major gods that was there at the beginning uh, uh, at the... Uh, creation of the world and, and helped to shape the, uh, the Hopi culture uh, throughout. So it's, it's, a, it's a major figure. And there's a lot of, like you said, elements to their history that indicate interaction between the Hopis and Masao. How much do you think of that is myth and lore, and how much do you think actually was some sort of interaction between, you know, a beyond human being or whatever you want to call it and, and, and these ancient peoples? Well, um, I think myth and lore uh, is simply a, a, a historical telling of uh, of ancient times. You know, um, there's a a big tradition of the Kachinas, which is uh, spirit beings, which I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a definite interaction between the spirit world and and the physical world through these Kachinas or, or spirit messengers, and uh, the Kachinas. Um, uh, you've probably seen the Kachina dolls that uh, the Hopi carve. Um, there, there, uh, there are many different shapes and types, and, and uh, the the masks are all different, and the costumes are all different, and um, uh, the dances are performed every year, um, and the, these uh, dancers 
dance all day long under the desert sun. And it's kind of a brutal uh, uh, test um, to, to dance all day long in, in the hot sun like that in the, in the middle of summer. Um, but the, the, the Hopi do this, and uh, the, to, to honor these, these spirit messengers that uh, essentially bring, bring uh, fertility and rainfall to, the, to this very, very dry uh, uh, land. So um, there's, a, there's a constant interaction between the spirit world and the physical world. In fact, um, uh, there's almost a reciprocal uh, relationship between uh, the underworld and uh, this uh, earth plane. For instance, when um, the Hopi are doing summer solstice uh, ceremonies, uh, the, the people in the underworld are doing the winter solstice ceremonies. So it's, it's almost a, uh, the underworld is kind of like a mirror of the earth plane. Just clear up this a little bit. When you say the underworld, what exactly, what's the connotation of that? Like, how would you describe that to, to a lay person like me? Or, uh, I don't want to call it like, like a white man, you know what I mean? Uh, what, what's, what's well, the, what can we, how can we compare that to something that, that would be palatable to the audience? Well, the, the underworld is the place that, that um, the Hopi go uh, when they die. They don't, they don't ascend to heaven like uh, we conceptualize it or Western culture conceptualizes it. But they go um, down beneath the earth. And in fact, there's a specific spot in the Grand Canyon that, um, that they believe they go down into and to enter this, um, this subterranean existence. Um, the, the underworld is also the place uh, uh, where um, the, the, the third world is located. We're, we're currently living in the fourth world, according to the Hopi. Uh, there have been three different worlds, um, and they all have been uh, created and destroyed, and we're, we're at the, uh, the end of the fourth world right now. But the Hopi also conceptualize um, the third world, or the previous era, uh, being located in this underworld place. And of course, um, the underworld is, is common uh, among a lot of cultures. Uh, the, the Greeks had, uh, you know, Homer talked about the underworld or going to the underworld. Um, so it, it's uh, common among uh, a lot of cultures that they they go down uh, into the earth, un, you know, and there's an actual, as I said, an actual place in the Grand Canyon called the Sipapu that they uh, go into this uh, underworld place after they die. Um, and and there's there's a, there's also a representation of this sipapu. There's a little hole in the ceremonial prayer chamber, the kiva. There's a little hole that represents this this uh, almost like a wormhole going to the to the underworld. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm kind of jumping around here chronologically, so forgive me. But that's uh, fine. That's fine. But when I hear when I hear your answers, then they remind me of other things in the book that I wanted to ask you about that uh, I didn't get into the notes. Um, Talk a little bit about this evolution of the worlds that you're talking about, uh, from the first world to the to the world we're in now. But uh, don't don't dive into the uh, the the end time prophecies type stuff yet, because we'll we'll get to that later. But uh, talk a little bit about that evolution, because from the description of it in the book, it it sounds like it correlates with a lot of world events that we think we know about from the past. You know, like the ancient floods and, and that kind of thing. So it sounds like you know uh, it, it mirrors a lot of what other cultures say about their evolution. Right. Um, the, the Hopi, uh, as I say, uh, believe that we're kind of at the end of the fourth world. Uh, you know, the Maya call it the fifth world and the Aztec call it the fifth world. But for the Hopi, it's, we're at the end of the fourth world. And there are three different worlds uh, uh, previous to this. Uh, the first world was destroyed by fire. And that might be something like maybe an asteroid or, or volcanism or something like that. The second world was destroyed by ice, and these are uh, these worlds are, are time periods or eras. Um, and the third world was destroyed by a great flood. So um, the Hopi have have endured these these um, destruction of the world before, and and uh, the the virtuous Hopis were reborn into the into the next world. Uh, there's a, a particular uh, group of um, of creatures um, called the ant people that that help the Hopi survive these cataclysms. Um, the the ant people uh, 
helped the Hopi survive this first world uh, and also the second world by giving them refuge in caverns or caves. Um, it's, it's interesting um, that the, the, the Hopi word uh, for ant is anu, and the Hopi word for friend is naki. So if you put those together, the anu naki helped the Hopi. These ant friends helped the Hopi survive these um, this destruction of, of these two worlds. Um, and they they took them into the caverns and uh, and taught them how to uh, sprout beans. For instance, there's a uh, a bean sprouting ceremony in February that kind of honors um, the ant people's um, um, teaching the, the Hopi how to how to uh, survive in these caverns. So the, the Hopi had to survive in in caves for a long time while the while the uh, the destruction was going on. So uh, it's, I, I think it's interesting that, the, you know, the Anunnaki uh, um, the, from uh, Sumerians would, would have a resonance with the, with the Hopi people here. Uh, these, these ant people were very, uh, very important in, the, in the Hopi mythology. And then before I give you a follow-up here on the ant people, is there a way of dating these different worlds uh, that we can sort of like look back and, and try and correlate them with with uh, you know other other uh, people's floods stories and maybe other people's uh, you know destruction by fire type stories. Mm -hmm. Well, Tim, um, you know the, the Hopi the Hopi uh, are not that concerned or not as specific as say the Maya are as far as, as dating. Mm -hmm. um, the Maya were were very were masters of time. Um, you know uh, the Hopi more or less uh, might be considered the keepers of space. Whereas the Maya, Maya are the are the keepers of time, so the the Hopi are never really specific about uh, you know dates like the the 2012 date of the Maya. They don't have anything like that. So uh, you you more or less have to to approximate you know. Yeah. You you can you might be able to say well the, well the end of the second world was uh, destroyed by ice. This might have been the ice ice age you know 10,000 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's it's hard to say to to pinpoint a specific date uh, with the Hopi. They're just not um, they don't conceptualize the world in in those terms. I don't believe. All right, and um, now to dive into the ant people because that is definitely one of the uh, most fascinating aspects of the book and and the, and the Hopi culture. Do they describe now? Obviously, they must be ant like because <laughs> uh, that that's what their name is. But what do they describe? What the ant people are like? Are they is there any sort of specific description of, of what you know your typical ant person might look like? Well, um, uh, the, the, the myths talk about the ant people, but um, there are also petroglyphs all over the Southwest that have uh, pictures of what I think the ant people are. There, there's some some pictures in my book of, uh, describing the ant people and showing petroglyphs, photographs of petroglyphs, or you know rock carvings of um, these creatures with like uh, antenna and, and kind of large eyes and, and spindly bodies and so um, you know whereas you know the the, uh, the myths don't actually describe them but the 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 rock art in this area uh, you can see a you know kind of ant-like resemblance in this in this rock art and it sounds like from their past, the ant people had quite an influence on, on the Hobies and helping them out and stuff. Whereabouts in the history of the Hobies do the ant people go away or, or stop interacting with the Hobies? Because obviously, you know, uh, we're not hearing stories nowadays about ant people. So at some point they, along the way, they, they had to go away. So what, well, what happened to the ant people? They don't really explain what what happened to them. Um, like I said, they... The, the Hopi were helped uh, during the destruction of the first world and the destruction of the second world by this, these entities, the ant people. And then um, during the destruction of the third world, which is by a flood, um, the ant people don't play into that, um, you know, that scenario. So um, the ant people uh, just kind of, uh, kind of disappear in, in the mythological uh, history. Uh, after that, after the destruction of the of the second world, so um, so that's the end of the ant people. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know. Um, and what about like a geo like a geographic location for um, 
where these ant people were. Uh, did the Hopi say, you know, we were we were here when the ant people helped us and brought us into their camps? Was is there any sort of area where we we would we would consider, you know, ant people territory? Um, well, um, th- they're not specific. You know, it's hard to to uh, correlate uh, mythological tales with uh, geography. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, th- there are some some caverns um, in the area. There's a, a place called Grand Canyon Caverns. Uh, it's an amazing uh, cave system that uh, that kind of empties out into a Grand Canyon. Uh, there's a, a passageway from the cavern system to the Grand Canyon. So um, the Hopi might have um, um, been re- referring to this particular cave system. Uh, there are a lot of caves in Grand Canyon. It's a, you know, a huge, uh, as you know, it's a huge uh, mm-hmm. a, a geological formation, and there are, there are a lot of caves, and there, there are um, particularly salt caves in Grand Canyon that um, the Hopi go once a year. Um, they make annual migrations to the Grand Canyon and collect a, a ritual, ritualistic salt from these particular caves in the Grand Canyon. So, uh, yeah, you know, there might be something to, uh, you know, it, right here in Arizona that um, the caves were located. And, um, of course, there's some, um, there's also the, the story about the lost city in the Grand Canyon. Um, uh, some, some, a friend of mine, Jack Andrews, has written, uh, uh, about this. He's also the artist who did the, uh, the, the artwork for the cover of my book, but he's also working on, uh, a, um, a uh, book about the lost city in the Grand Canyon that um, um, supposedly was um, found by a Smithsonian um, exhibition in 1906, and um, th- this uh, this cave system that was in the in the side of the Grand Canyon, um, it's it just amazing uh, the the size of it. It went hundreds of feet into the into the cliff and. And there, there were uh, enough room for um, for uh, hundreds of, of uh, people to, to fit in this cave, and there, there's supposedly mummies found here. Um, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this story, but it's it's you know, a fascinating one. That uh, I just kind of touch upon it uh, briefly in my book. 